Okay, so there can be no doubt whatsoever that we are recording. Um, okay, so this morning we are we are looking at developing reflective inclusive practice using the National Framework for Inclusion. Um, and we will hear firstly in a moment from Dr. Kirsten Darla McQuiston, who will take us through a wee bit of background to Scottish context. And then we'll have a think about the National Framework for Inclusion and how that aligns with inclusive pedagogical approaches in action. There will be plenty of time for you to get into breakout groups and have discussions with each other. Um, it absolutely isn't going to be us sitting talking at you all of the time. Um, so bef before we move any further, um, just to say that um, it's, it's, it's almost inevitable because we are talking about inclusion, that this workshop may well contain material that some attendees may find triggering. So we'll be talking about additional support needs, inclusion, equality, diversity. So please look out for yourself and others. So feel free to take a break. Um, we've already said about um, not having to have your cameras and your microphones on, particularly in the, the this part of the session which is being recorded. Breakout room sessions won't be recorded and um, we, we do ask so that you can participate as fully um, in those breakouts that you do have your cameras and your microphones on during that time. There'll also be the chat function that works um, within the breakout rooms. But if you do find anything triggering or upsetting, um, please do seek support from your university student welfare services. And there's a couple of links on the slide to breathing space and to some Samaritans. Some, some, some okay, so a wee bit of housekeeping. Um, we will be using Menti for a couple of um, feedback quizzes. So please have www.menti.com open on your phone or in a separate browser. And when the time comes, we'll pop that information into the chat as well. There'll be two breakout group activities during the session and the instructions that you'll need will be on the slides. So it's probably helpful for you to either take a screenshot of that slide or a photo so you know what you need to do when you get into the breakout room because you probably won't be able to see the presentation slides once you've gone away from this main room. And as I said just before, if you've got questions, please pop them into the chat and there'll be time for us to respond to those during the session. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kirsten Darling McQuiston, who's going to talk to us about the Scottish context. Thanks, Kirsten. Over to you. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, as Di said, my name's Kirsten, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm really looking forward to the conversations that unfold. As Di said, we want to create opportunities for participation and to hear your views. So we're hoping that it is a two way conversation. So I'm going to begin this presentation by sharing a little of the legal and policy context in Scotland. Now, I realise that some of this will be familiar to you by now. I'm sure you'll have written about some of the policies that I'm going to talk about in the assignments. And actually, since you've been in schools more recently than I have, you're likely more familiar with how some of these policies and acts are enacted in practice. OK, and, we, and that's what we would like to hear about. But however, I am going to begin by setting the scene. Um, now, I'm just going to see if I can move the slides forward or Di is going to do it for me. Um, Thank you so much, Di. Okay, so here I've tried to briefly capture, capture some of the most significant aspects of the legal and policy context in relation to inclusion in Scotland. You'll hopefully be able to see that this slide picks up from the year 2000 on the left-hand side of the screen with the Standards in Scotland School Act. Um, and that this reflected the international drive at the time stemming from the Salamanca Statement to ensure that schools accommodate all children. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these boxes in detail, but I do want to highlight some of the acts that are perhaps most significant in the context of our conversation today. So, for example, the Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act 2004, 
This act brought about significant change in language. And as we know, language is very important when we're talking about inclusion. This act replaced the term special educational needs with additional support needs, a term that I'm sure you're all familiar with now. This is a broader term that includes not only children with physical or learning difficulties, but also children and young people whose educational progress is limited by their social circumstances, which, as you likely know, is a key concern here in Scotland. I'll also point out getting it right for every child, which I'm confident you'll all be familiar with. And I'm quite sure you go to bed at night reciting those Shinari indicators. Um, getting it right for every child is often described as a landmark children's policy framework, which has been put in place to improve children's well-being via early intervention, universal service provision and multi-agency working. So GERFIC really marked a shift from welfare to well-being. Additionally, we have the UNCRC, the United, um, United Nations. <laughs> oh, I've lost my words. Too much coffee this morning. Uh, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, which should become embedded within Scots law in the not so distant future. This includes a plethora of interconnected rights, such as the right to no discrimination, the right to education, and an education at that that helps children and young people to fully develop their personalities, talents, and abilities. So maybe when the UNCRC is fully in, enshrined in Scots law, we might have further changes in language. Let's see. So we could say, based on this uh, legal and policy landscape, that we have a really fruitful context in Scotland for an inclusive education system and an inclusive national curriculum. But what is the reality? And if we could move to the next slide, please, Di. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's take our conversation to the curriculum for excellence, which again, you'll all be becoming more and more familiar with. The vision that drove the inception of Curriculum for Excellence has been credited most recently by the OECD for it being inclusive and flexible. A vision that was intended to support the holistic development of all children and young people and enable teachers to respond to the needs and abilities of children and young people in their classes. However, Curriculum for Excellence has also been widely critiqued, including by Mark Priestley and Walter Humes for being confused and confusing, a mixed up curriculum that lacks the coherent structure to ne needed to live up to these inclusive and progressive vision that underpinned its inception. Some argue that we place too much emphasis on the attainment of a narrow set of curricular outcomes, which can create challenges for practitioners who are striving to create inclusive classroom communities. What do you think? That's what we're really keen to know. Um, so having been, been in schools, having worked with Curriculum for Excellence, what are your experiences? So what we're going to do now is, technology allowing, we're going to pop you into breakout rooms and give you an opportunity to discuss the statements on the screen. So as Di said at the beginning, you might want to get out your phone and take a picture of this um, slide. We can also um, write the, um, the, the statements to discuss in the chat bar too, because you know what it's like as soon as you go into a breakout room, your memory just goes blank. You have no idea what you're meant to be talking about. So we'll, we'll, we'll put in steps to remind you and just have a little bit of a time, maybe five minutes to discuss your experiences and all your experiences are valid. So do you think that the Curriculum for Excellence is a really flexible curriculum that allows you to be responsive to the needs and abilities of the young people and children you've been working with? Or is it rigid? Is it too focused on just literacy and numer numeracy and particular outcomes, for example? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, thank you, Di. Um, so uh, I'll... 
Okay, welcome back everybody. Okay, so hopefully everybody's back and we've not lost anybody along, along the way. Okay. So if you could please make sure your microphones are on mute. Okay, Kirsten, are you ready for me to move the, the slide onto the mentee? Slide? Yes, yes, please. So based on your discussion, folks, we have our, our mentee here with the code three five eight seven nine one double three so that's nine one three three and we've got two questions and you can respond is it with a yes a no or not sure don't know so is for you this is your own experience do you think curriculum for excellence is holistic flexible and inclusive and you'll have a chance to respond to that question. I think Dai's put 60 seconds and we'll be able to see the, uh, the pie chart evolve as you respond. And it'll just be really interesting for us to get a sense of your thoughts and experiences. Okay, so, so far, yes is getting the The majority of the votes, still just over 30 seconds. Interestingly, a few don't knows, and that's really interesting as well. That's okay if you don't know, absolutely okay. I'm not sure I know. <laughs> okay, 20, 20 seconds left, and it looks like it's quite settled there with 14 yeses, three don't knows, and three no's. So I guess we, we might get a bit of an inverse of that uh, with our next mentee question. Uh, let's see. So, and even if you thought, um, you think, yes, CFE is holistic and flexible, but you might still think that it also has a narrow focus on predetermined outcomes. So this will be interesting to see the correlation between the two. Uh, we've got a message from Hope here. So I'll read that out while we're, while we're waiting for the results to come in. Our group thought it's holistic and flexible, but we questioned the inclusiveness in relation to additional support needs and allowing all pupils to achieve. Thank you so much, Hope. That sounds like you and your group had a really fruitful discussion. And I think you're absolutely right to be raising these questions. It's so encouraging for us to hear our new teachers going in with these questions at the forefront. Front. So thank you. And likewise, if you want to elaborate on your response, please feel free to put your, your thoughts um, in the chat. So very similar, or oh, actually similar in terms of the, sh the, the look of the pie chart, but what we're saying here, what it looks like is, yes, it is flexible and holistic, but also there is too much emphasis on a narrow set of predefined outcomes. How fascinating. Uh, thank you very much, folks. Um, we'd love to get into the nitty gritty with you if, uh, if time would allow, but that is just really, really f food for thought for us. So we appreciate that. Thanks, Di. Um, Wonderful. So I'll pick back up uh, with the sort of the last section of my presentation before I hand on to Di. So as we can see from your responses and your lived experiences of being student teachers in Scotland, um, is that it's not all plain sailing in Scotland. We might have this really fruitful policy and legal context in terms of inclusion, However, it's not always that easy. So what we're going to do is for this last section of my presentation is to highlight some of the challenges and you, these might resonate with you, um, but I'm going to land on the opportunities uh, before I hand over to Dai. Okay, Dai, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. So within the research and literature around inclusion, teachers, and teachers' attitudes 
are of such great importance of in, in enabling inclusion. Okay, we can whatever the the policy landscape is. If it isn't for the teachers, we're in great trouble. So as folks like Lanny Florian, Christine Black Hawkins, Martin Rouse, and many others have stated, teachers must believe that they are capable of teaching all learners. So you can imagine when we read this headline in a recent TESS article that it was slightly worrying. The article written by Emma Seath reports on an independent review of additional support needs in Scotland headed up by Angela Morgan and actually really echoes uh, Hope's comment in the side. So Angela Morgan said that some teachers thought they should only be teaching children who can achieve in exams. And we're upfront about that. Other teachers, meanwhile, had become cynical because they once believed in inclusion, but hadn't seen it being delivered in practice and had lost heart. The whole concept of inclusion is not fully embraced. There is not a belief that mainstreaming or inclusion of all children is something that should be be done. The pers perspectives of the teachers captured here suggest there, that there are some challenges in translating policy into practice in the Scottish context, and we need to acknowledge those challenges. However, what should also be noted is that inclusive approaches are possible. Di, if you could move on to the next slide for me, please. So this is arguably less of a headline, but the same review also found that nationally there are outstanding examples of mainstream education settings that have stretched and adapted their culture and environments to the benefit of all children and young people. And this is the point I'm going to pass over to Di. And what I'd like you to leave you with is the message that inclusive approaches are possible. Yes, there are challenges, but if we think carefully about our learning and teaching, using the support available, including the National Framework for Inclusion, which Di is going to explore with you, then you can all make a difference to young children's lives. So thank you, Di. I'll pass on to you now and thank you folks for your participation. We greatly appreciate it. Okay, so I just want to thank Kirsten again for giving us such a, a stimulating start to the workshop. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes thinking about reflective inclusive practice and, and thinking about um, inclusive pedagogical approaches and how and how they, they align with the national framework for in, 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 inclusion. So firstly thinking about why, why, why do we need to be reflective practitioners, particularly around inclusive practice? So we know from Scottish government going back five years that inclusion is the cornerstone of Scottish education. Um, it's, it, is, it is very much one of those underpinning principles and that belief underpins presumption of mainstreaming um, where um, most, if not all children, are expected to go to the local mainstream school unless their needs are such that a specialist provision would be more appropriate. And that absolutely has its challenges. And we, we know that dis, despite best efforts, we don't always get it right for every child, but we're absolutely working towards that. But as teachers, we've got a key role, not only in providing an education, but in making sure that, that we uphold learners' rights to an education. Um, if we think about the UNCRC, which as Kirsten said, it's going to be enacted in Scots law quite soon, that, that will make law what we already do day in, day out, because as teachers and as student teachers, we make sure that pupils' rights to an education are upheld. And one of the reasons, one of the ways in which we do that is in identifying and addressing barriers to learning um, through inclusive pedagogical approaches. And we know that inclusive pedagogy, it 
And from, um, I'm just going to quote here from Florian and Black Hawkins, it develops a rich learning community that is characterized by learning opportunities sufficiently available for everybody. And I think sometimes when, when, we, when, we, when we try to meet all children's needs, it can, it can be really tricky because sometimes we, we provide wonderful activities that, that may inadvertently exclude pupils. So for example, you might have a pupil who is working three years below their life age and you give them a highly differentiated and very appropriate program to follow, but they always work in parallel with everybody else in the class. Um, what inclusive pedagogy does is it, it, it looks at what, what learning is everybody going to do and how do we make sure that everybody can access it in a way that is appropriate for either their life age or their developmental age. So one of the questions that I want you to keep in mind as we go through the next few slides is how do we know if our practice is using the principles of inclusive pedagogy? So firstly, just to, just to say about the three principles that, that under, under, underpin this, 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 this approach. And much, much as with Kirsten's slides, some of you will be very familiar with the IPAA, some of you perhaps less so. But principle one is that in our classrooms, we have very diverse pupil populations. And that, that extends out to to teachers in the staff room, it extends to our student teachers, to our teacher educators. We are all unique individuals and that means that we, 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 are, we are starting from a position of diversity. So difference is ordinary and we, we need to expect it. And one of the things that we do with principle one is, is we, we look very much from a positive image of the child we, we get to know lived experiences of children and we make sure that our, our pedagogy accounts for classroom di 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 diversity. Principle two is that as teachers, we are capable of teaching all children. Yes, we come up against problems, but problems are challenges for teaching. Pro problems are not things that make us stop and say, I can't do this, this child's in the wrong place. Um, as, as inclusive teachers, it's, it's for us to use all of our critical thinking skills that we've developed through initial teacher education to come up with solutions. Um, one of the under, underpinning fundamentals of the National Framework for Inclusion is that we adopt an open-ended view of a child's capacity to learn. And as we can see here, principle two aligns in that it's about finding the edge of what children can do. What, what's, what are they absolutely able to do? What can we do to push them that and, and, and stretch and challenge a, a wee bit more? So rather than adopting a deficit view, we're thinking, how, how much can this child achieve if we put the right support in place? And when we think about gifted and talented and able pupils, it's thinking about making sure that they are, they are encouraged to push the very edges of their ability as well. Um, it's, 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 it's not sufficient to think, okay, so um, this pupil has done everything that we need them to do, great, well done. It's about thinking, what next? In a, in a child's learning journey. And to do that, it's about teaching with understanding of children's competence, being respectful of diversity, responding positive, positively, and using diversity as a very positive teaching tool. Um, principle three very much underpins and aligns with GERFEC. It is about collaborating with others to address those challenges. That might be your stage partner. It might be your mentor teacher when you're out in schools on placement. It might be other student teachers. And it's, it's about making sure that when you're on placement and when you're back in university, that you've got a network of peer support to bounce ideas around with. And of course, collaborative working as a team, we have to do that to meet GERFEC outcomes. So I wanted to mention about the National Framework for Inclusion. Um, so um, 
the, we, we, are, we are just about to launch the third edition of the framework um, and originally it was developed back in 2008 and it, it's, it's been supported all the way through by the Scottish Government and the General Teaching Council in Education Scotland. Um, it links to the, to the standards from the General Teaching Council and that's, that's why we are just coming up with the third edition, because as you'll be aware, the standards were refreshed back in August last year. Um, so very soon we will have a brand new edition. Um, some, some of you will already have engaged with these questions because members of the Scottish Universities Inclusion Group who developed this have started to use the, the, the questions that are in that um, Ahead, ahead of print, ahead of um, ahead of um, getting the the framework onto the website, um, but the framework it aims to support teachers at all levels of their of their professional journey. Whether you're a student teacher, whether you are a teacher educator or a head teacher, it provides a tool that teachers can use to reflect on in, 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 inclusive practice. Okay. So as I mentioned already, um, the spirit of the framework is based on, a, on an open-ended view of a child's capacity to learn, and it's designed to support teacher education for inclusion. And one of the reasons for that is because all of us as teachers have a responsibility for inclusion. And so because inclusion is a cornerstone of Scottish education, it has to be at the very heart of teacher education. And if, if it isn't at the heart of teacher education, then we've 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 not we've not we've not um, we've we've not embraced the Scottish conceptualisation, which, as Kirsten said, was so groundbreaking in in the way that it moved away from thinking about special educational needs and started thinking about a holistic approach to additional support needs, overcoming and identifying barriers to learning. And inclusion involves participation of everybody in our schools and classrooms. So what, what we've got here is we've got, we've got the, the inclusive pedagogical approaches and action principles and some example questions so that you can see how, how the framework helps you to interrogate and develop your practice around the, the inclusive pedagogical approaches. So when we think about differences, ordinary, and we should expect to find difference in diversity. Some of the questions that you may ask might be, how do I address the needs of all of my learners? Thinking about that open-ended capacity to learn. Um, linking with that, why is it important that we have that open-ended view of pupils' attainment and progress? And the question in the middle, thinking about how your practice is developing so that it's inclusive of everybody without stigmatizing, without marginalizing. And as I was saying just before, it's really easy for us to fall into the trap through differentiating very effectively of inadvertently marginalizing some, some of the learners who are with, with us in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in, in, in our classrooms. And then principle two, is about our capacity as teachers to teach all children and that the problems and the challenges that we face that we, we that, that as teachers we can overcome them so it's thinking about how well I know my learners um, how do I respond to their differences in ways that enable everybody to participate and what does it mean to be a rights respecting classroom practitioner um, and make you know so because I think sometimes, sometimes it's it's very easy to go onto placement and think, oh yes, I'm in a rights respecting school, and the school has got an award for that. It's got a, a quality mark. But what does that mean for me in practice, day to day? How how am I going to uphold a a, a rights respecting ethos? Because one of our principal jobs is to make sure that children's rights are upheld. So how do we do that in practice? And thinking about collaboration with others so that we can address challenges. So thinking about the learning community that, that, you've, that you've entered on placement, 
who do I need to develop and sustain those relations with? Yes, it will absolutely be your mental teacher, but is it a teaching assistant? Is it a PSA? Um, is it a support for learning teacher? It may be a speech therapist, a social worker, the list goes on. But also thinking about some relationships will be really easy to develop and maintain, others will be more challenging. And that, that, that might be because some professionals aren't based in school, they may be coming to deliver a particular course of therapy once a week, and it can be really tricky to liaise with them as much as you would like. And also thinking about actions that you might take to make those relationships more, 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 more productive. And bearing in mind, of course, that as student teachers, sometimes there's not an awful lot you can do about that. But thinking about your experience as a student teacher of, of developing relationships, of working in a team around the child and thinking, what might I want to do differently once I've got my own class in probation here and beyond? Okay, so we are going to go into breakout rooms again in just a moment. Um, so just, just as with the, the pre previous slide, um, you might want to take a photo or a screenshot of this slide. So we've, we've got a good half an hour um, for you to go into breakout rooms. Um, there are four, four questions from the National Framework for Inclusion 3rd Edition. Um, please choose a, two of those questions, any two we are easiest to which ones you discuss um, but please discuss two of them and there'll be time for you to do quick feedback either via the chat or via popping your microphones on when you come back in. Um, so the first two questions are from SPR1 which is about being a teacher in Scotland and the other two are from the, the other, other two areas of the, the SSPR um, aspect of the framework. So thinking about how do I make sense of differences? And in what ways does this inc enhance inclusion and a sense of belonging? In what ways do I ensure diversity of learners is valued in my classes? How might interdisciplinary approaches to learning enhance participation? And finally, how do I acknowledge and embrace learner diversity in the, 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 the classroom? And if you give me two moments I will hi folks welcome back into the main room if you can make sure that your microphones are muted just now just waiting for everybody to make the way back over Okay, so that should be everybody back now, I think. Okay, so just a wee, a wee reminder that we are recording. So if you don't want to be on the recording to keep your camera and your microphone off. Um, but thank you so much for um, engaging in those breakout discussions and I hope that you found those useful. Um, so we've got time just now to take questions from you and also to take feedback from those breakout groups. So um, if people want to either pop comments, thoughts into the chat, or if you want to pop your hand up, if you'd like to put your microphone on and tell us a wee bit of feedback, um, I'll just give you a moment to have a think. And just, just to say, as Kirsten said earlier on, everybody's views, opinions and experiences are equally valid. So please don't sit thinking, I don't know very much. There's nothing that I can share. Ev everybody's conversations will have been re really rich and we are really keen to hear from you. Hi there. Um, Hi. Our group sort of first of all concentrated on the interdisciplinary approaches okay. um, and we were all saying 
sort of we had a couple of primary a couple of high school students um and how we actually really like that way of kind of tackling certain subjects and topics and um, just because obviously naturally you know pupils are going to have varying abilities different strengths weaknesses so there's that kind of one aspect where you're kind of eliminating or potentially eliminating some student anxieties and um, so you've maybe set them a maths pr project but you're kind of almost disguising it in kind of problem solving or I've heard of people doing art projects and things you know the children aren't necessarily going into that thinking oh well I you know I'm really rubbish at maths this is going to be really challenging for me um, and it's a really surprising way of finding different um, you know strengths from different students and mm -hmm. um, but then we were also discussing how that is recorded sometimes um, I was sort of just sharing an experience that I did French with my pupils and I had one particular child who essentially flat out refused to participate within the classroom environment mm -hmm. uh, however when we did PE I would often use a lot of French language so if we were playing four corners you know the corners would be colors or my instructions would be in French mm -hmm. and I could tell that he absolutely understood you know and enjoyed what it was that we were doing so we were sort of just discussing how how it is that you would be able to essentially formally record that because if somebody asked me for a written piece of work showing his understanding I couldn't you know produce that however I can say well I have seen that he is able to comprehend and you know through whatever and um, so that was just a couple of things that, that we were talking about. Perfect Katie thank, thank you so much for feeding back um Claire I can see you've got your hand up do you want to come in? Hello, um, we had a really good chat. Um, we talked about lots, lots of things. Um, one of them was the challenge in offering support discreetly um, to certain learners and how this is hard um, not to kind of draw attention or highlight that they need that extra support. Um, so we talked about different ways that we could potentially do that um, and also um, kind of generally how you can have more discussions about difference and inclusion uh, and diversity in, in your classes. Um, our, we, we all, all three of us also kind of agreed that there are real problems with the presumption of mainstream uh, policy and um, all of us had experienced a child who was violent in the class, um, who would hit other children, um, had one experience of a boy who had to be continuously excluded um, due to violent behaviour. And I guess I, I personally have real worries about the impact that has not just on his own self-esteem, but on the, the way that other children will perceive disability because um, they were frightened of him. And um, in that situation, that was an example of inclusion really not working. Um, and he was in the process of being moved to another school, but it had taken three years already, um, three years of literally um, attacking children on a daily basis. So. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work, um, although the principles of it, absolutely. How can you, how could anyone disagree with, you know, a policy that wants, we're looking for a more compassionate, understanding society. But um, when there's violence involved, I feel that there has to be a kind of red flag and, you know, a way, a way, a way out. Thanks. <laughs> Claire, that is perfect. Thank you so much for feeding back from your group. Um, okay, um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, does anybody else want to come in and share? And as and um, I can see Kirsten's giving feedback in in the chat to people. And yeah, I I, I agree. It it can be it can be really tricky um, to record um, to record people's attainment, um, especially when it doesn't happen in the actual lesson that you would quite want it to to happen in and yeah as Kirsten said yeah that was a really challenging example thank you for sharing that Claire okay Megan you've got your camera on do you want to come in yeah I was just wondering if maybe I could jump in there we were having a little discussion about kind of talking about universal design for learning within this whole concept as well and about planning for difference beforehand rather than the reacting to which we kind of see with our differentiation mm -hmm. maybe using information you have beforehand collecting it having these conversations but also maybe 
creating spaces beforehand that you don't have to react to these different things to accommodate mm -hmm. for, but having these spaces in place already that already will accommodate for different mm -hmm. differences and don't highlight it in these ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so very 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 much planning proactively rather than reactively. Absolutely, and and certainly when we think about um, IPAA, it does align with Universal Design for Learning in that it does encourage us to think about who are the learners that we are planning for what are their needs what do we need to do to make sure that everybody can access what we are wanting them to to do yeah thank you that's a a a, a, real, a, a real a real a real a really nice point thank you okay anybody else let me just click through um Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else's hands up. That's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so let me just finally move the slide on. So there is a wee reference page. Um, what we can do is we, we do have all of your emails from the, the email with the, the, the links. So we can send you a copy of the presentation. Um, and if you keep an eye out on Sira's um, you um, see Twitter feed and the website and there'll be an, an announcement comes out as to when the recording is available. We can also flag up via email that that's available for you as well. Um, so just to finish off with, um, firstly, thank you so much for coming along today for choosing the, the Inclusive Practice Workshop. Um, thank you again to Kirsten for her contribution and to Stella and Lisa, my co-conveners, for all the organisation in the background. Um, and just to say that if you are interested in joining our network, you don't have to be a fully paid up member of CIRA to be part of the Inclusive Practice Network. It doesn't have to cost you a penny, um, but it's something that you can put on your CV. Um, and we, if, 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 you, if you would like to be involved or you want to know a bit more, please have a look at our webpage, um, contact any of us. Um, just to say that that we we, we do have um, a, a, ve a very a very broad definition of inclusive practice. So not only thinking about pupils with additional support needs, but thinking about diversity of gender, um, ethnic minor eth ethnic minority pupils, and um, all 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 protected characteristics. Okay. So thank you so much for coming along today. Have a lovely rest of the day, a wonderful summer when it finally arrives and good luck next year, whether that is coming back for another year with us as student teachers or if you've just finished, good luck with your probationary years and good luck with, good luck everybody with um, your, your teaching careers. Thank you so much everybody for coming along today. <laughs>